Welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for joining us. Well, are emergency rooms overcrowded? We'll get into that with the uh, leader from the Pennsylvania Medical Society. But first, will we get a state tax cut? We'll talk to a couple of journalists about that and more after these words. Welcome to the fast-paced and unrehearsed weekly discussion featuring the leaders who help shape your world. Join us as we address the issues that impact you each and every day. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Well, I'll tell you, we have a number of important topics to get to on Pennsylvania Newsmakers. And let, we're going to start with a couple of the state's leading journalists. Sitting across from me is Mark Levy with the Associated Press and Jan Murphy. She's the Capitol reporter with Penn Live Patriot News. All right. All that we hear out of Harrisburg these days is state tax cut, state tax cut, will we get one? And um, so s Republicans in the Senate have passed what they call is the uh, biggest state tax cut in history. It uh, now goes to the House, which is controlled by Democrats, and it enters the budget season of negotiations with the governor, Josh Shapiro. And but if, if Republicans are serious about making this their top budget priority, it's a $3 billion a year tax cut. Um, most of it would be uh, an income tax cut. It would take the state personal income tax from 3.07% yeah. back to the 2.8% it was in around uh, 2003 when we last saw it increase. So um, it's not a big tax cut, but it would affect uh, millions of uh, wage earners in Pennsylvania. Right. And it also includes the elimination of the gross receipts tax on your utility bill, which people just pay and don't even probably know that they're paying. But combined, they said that this is going to result in a $3 billion savings to taxpayers. That's, Where does this stand now in the legislature? <laughs> it's like Mark said, it's the start of budget season. This is, you know, the Republicans have... Right staked out their position, and, and now we'll see where it goes from here. But uh, the House Republicans jumped on it and said, you know, to their House Democratic colleagues that control the House chamber, you know, we urge you to support this. Let's, yeah. let's and give Shapiro, people a break. Has Governor Shapiro made any comments about it? So he basically said, welcome to the table, right? Um, there, there's a $14 billion surplus in Pennsylvania. Democrats are talking about how they want to spend some of it on public schools, et cetera, expanding social services. But um, until now, Republicans hadn't really said what they wanted to do with it. So the governor didn't say he supported this, but he did say, welcome to the table. Let's talk about what we're going to do with all this money sitting in the state treasury. Okay. And he also, I mean, the other thing that take note of this is that now the Republicans are, are saying that they're willing to spend down some of our reserves, which they, you know, I think that they feel that that could be common ground between the, the administration and, and the Republicans. And this is an even-numbered year, which translation, they're up election, for re-election, yeah. right? Right, right. And But also the subtext here is that Pennsylvania is really a deficit state. It has a shrinking working-age population, That's a growing sure, elderly yeah. population, and it has reverted to its its usual deficit status. It, it, it runs deficits every year. Tax collections are not keeping up with spending. And so the danger here is that uh, a big spending item or a big tax cut item will uh, deplete the surplus within a few years. And it, we'll be back in the position of needing to is, cut spending. Is the interest taxes. in this in the legislature high? Is it one of those things that everyone's talking about? Well, it's hard to uh, it, it's hard to oppose a tax cut when you're an elected official. <laughs> That's true. But, um, I, you know, Senator Haywood pointed out, you know, he, he cited some statistics that said for six for a family that has a sixty seven thousand dollar income, the this tax break would result in one hundred eighty one dollars. And, and while the Republicans are saying this is a bold move, he said to my constituents, this isn't bold. So it. You know, it, it could end up being that they split the difference. They give some of it part of a tax cut sure. and then spend some more on, on other programs. It's yeah. And, and the point that Democrats have made is that the, the bulk of the benefits go to higher wage earners. They would like to see tax cuts that benefit the lowest wage earners. Mm -hmm. So like an earned income tax credit, which or, or raising the tax forgiveness threshold right. so that 
the lower wage earners, um, you know, people who earn, say, 50000 or below a year. At least they're not the talking about spend. something unpopular, which would be a tax hike, right? <laughs> no, not with a surplus. <laughs> and both of you have been through those efforts to raise the tax over the years. And that's always controversial. And you don't. And if they ever do it, they don't want to do it in an election year, right? When they all right. I mean, there's a reason why the income tax hasn't been raised in 20 years. Yeah, there you go. All right, let's run to a break and we talk. Again. Let's talk about cell phone ban, where that might go, and we'll do that uh, soon. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania State Education Association, bringing the power of a great education to our schools, our students, and our communities. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Please visit pahighwayinfo.org. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Welcome back. Well, let's uh, get into the whole issue of uh, expanding the cell phone ban. Uh, uh, anytime you talk about cell phones, you always get into one controversy after another. Am I right, Jan Murphy? Well, it, this is uh, targeted at cell phone use, handheld cell phone use while driving. It's, you know, I, anybody who drives has seen this, and it's, it's a, a form of distracted driving. And in fact, you know, in one of the um, arguments for passing this is that we have more dis distracted driving crashes in Pennsylvania than we have DUI crashes, related yeah. crashes. But what this ban would um, do, and it, it really, um, it, it takes effect in a year, and then for a year, people would get a written notice. So could you notice, but have, fines have your into, uh, to use. cell phone, you're not holding it, but That's, just... That's it. No handheld cell no phone ha use. No handheld. Right. But I mean, you could have uh, in your ear. Right, or in the car, you know. Um, in the car, through the car, yeah. But there are some exceptions, and, and that's, uh, you know, if you need, if you're driving by a, a, a crash scene and, and you wanted to call 911, I mean, there, you know, and you would right. be noticed, you know, on the phone, that's okay. I mean, there's, or for navigation, I mean, there's certain exceptions that are permitted, but... Also for emergency responders and, and yep. for people who are using it, I guess, as part of their, their regular work duties uh, authorized by their employer. Where is it in the legislature? Uh, it's, it's on the governor's desk, and he's said that he'll sign he's it. He's going to sign it. I yeah. thought it passed. Yeah. In, in fact, he was one of the earliest proponents back when he was in the legislature more than a decade ago. Um, he was one of the earliest proponents for uh, putting a penalty on cell phone use while driving. Almost two decades ago. I mean, that 2006. It's, and that's what I said whenever he signs the bill. Granted, um, Senator Brown has been pushing this for 10 years, but I said he should get to keep the pen that they yeah. <laughs> signed well, the we've bill all, with. We've all witnessed distracted drivers. I mean, that's very, very common. With Those very lines so. down the center of the road don't mean <laughs> anything anymore. No, they sure don't. <laughs> yeah. They sure don't. All right, we have two minutes left uh, uh, in this segment. Let's talk a little bit about mail-in ballots. Where does that stand? So the state uh, made an effort late last year to redesign uh, the uh, mail-in ballot envelope and instructions to try to help people cut down on the kinds of mistakes that they might make that gets their ballot thrown out. out. And right. so what we saw in the primary is what the state says is a lower error rate. So they think that their changes improved. And these changes are trying to uh, explain to people that you have to date the ballot uh, with, the, with the date that you're actually, you know, filling in your choices before you mail it. Um, you have to sign it, the envelope, and, and you have to put the ballot in the secrecy envelope inside the outer envelope. And so they, they say that the error rate was 13 percent lower in last month's primary than it was in the 2023 primary. Um, and, and it's critical because we do have a presidential election this year. Pennsylvania will be um, decisive in choosing the next president, as it usually is. Right. And um, for Democrats, 
um, they're casting about three fourths of the mail in ballots. So for Democrats cutting so down, so there's those a mistakes, political dimension to it. There's a there's a very serious political <laughs> dimension to it. Republicans um, shy away from voting by mail. Um, Democrats embrace it. So, uh, but for both parties, um, you know, getting your votes in and getting your votes counted is is of uh, the utmost importance, especially when presidential elections in this state are typically decided by less than one percentage point. Yeah, go ahead. You want to add something? No, I mean that's Mark's right. That um, you know, in a way, I feel like we're just finally getting our footing on this this new way of voting. I mean, granted, it was introduced from a 2019 law, and it's taken us five years <laughs> to try to figure out how how it really works. But um, yeah. it's you know, it is certainly a convenience for for some folks. And um, but you know, there's a, the, like Mark said, the majority of people do still prefer to vote in person. All right, coming up, we're going to do emergency room. Uh, overcrowding and then something called none competes for physicians very important topics which we'll get to after these words this broadcast of pennsylvania newsmakers is brought to you by cross-state credit union association credit unions where people are worth more than money to find a credit union that is right for you go to ibelong.org and by the energy association of pennsylvania Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Association of Pennsylvania State College and University Faculties, representing the faculty and coaches who are devoted to providing quality public higher education for Pennsylvania's college students. All right, we're going to turn to healthcare topics, and joining me to do that is, is Dr. Kristen Sandell. She's the president of the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Doctor, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. I'll tell you, this is something I never thought I would be, that we would be talking about on Pennsylvania Newsmakers, emergency room overcrowding. That can be a very serious health care problem for folks, right? Well, it certainly can. You know, our emergency departments are our safety net in the healthcare yeah, system. Yeah. And, you know, patients need a 24-7 option to seek care when they're ill or when they have an accident. And so the emergency department in most communities is the only place to provide that care. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, how overcrowded are they? Significantly overcrowded. And it doesn't matter what part of the state you're in. It doesn't matter if you're in an urban setting or in a rural setting. Our emergency departments are overcrowded. There's a multitude of reasons for that, and the reasons actually vary depending on uh, what type but of community what are you're the in. What are a couple of the big ones? Sure. So b the biggest ones are staffing issues, especially our nursing staffing. Yeah. Um, also, the amount of beds that are available uh, at certain specific hospitals, and then we have other issues like lack of access to care, either primary physicians, our substance abuse patients, or our behavioral health patients, which has becoming. A significant amount of patients within the last few years, especially after the COVID crisis. Yeah. I'll tell you, let's move on to another subject. Uh, none compete clauses in employment contracts. What, first of all, what, what's a non complete clause in a contract? Sure. So, non compete clauses essentially are designed to prevent patient migration from one practice or one system to another. So essentially, if you are a physician and you are employed by a practice or by a healthcare system, most of the time there is a clause that prevents you from working either in a radius, like a, a certain mile radius, 30 miles, 60 miles, or prevents you from uh, working uh, within a certain um, area. And so what we're seeing is the physicians, you know, are sometimes having to move out of their communities, um, move wow. their families, uh, and patients don't have access to them because they're not able to work in that in that area. Yeah, yeah. are there generally shortages in, uh, in uh, with physicians? Yeah, so you know there is a physician shortage, and there's a shortage of of healthcare um, availability to certain patients, and sometimes that varies depending again on on urban or or or, or uh, rural communities. Yeah. Um, and so you know if there are only two options in the area yeah, in that limited point. access, you know physicians have to move sometimes out of the state. Yeah, 
Let's run to a break. When we come back, I want to talk about uh, is there new legislation dealing with non-compete agreements? We'll get to that uh, soon. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Inspired physicians committed to the good health of Pennsylvanians and the advancement of the practice of medicine. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania American Water. We keep life flowing across the Keystone State. All right, I'm chatting with the president of the Pennsylvania Medical Society. We're talking about health care. Uh, before I get back to uh, non-compete agreements, we were talking about emergency room overcrowding. What's being done about it? I don't think we got to that question. That's a great question. Uh, the Pennsylvania Medical Society is currently uh, having a task force uh, that's trying to work on this issue. We've engaged a number of stakeholders, key stakeholders in the state, one being the Department of Health um, under Dr. Bogan, and also we've been um, uh, having conversations with the Hospital Association of Pennsylvania, with the Emergency Medicine Association, Pennsylvania ASAP, um, and various other stakeholders to say, what can we do as a group collectively to try to expand emergency room capacity that and also uh, where, where can we provide additional resources in the community uh, to keep point, patients yeah. out of the hospital and also how do we how do we train our healthcare professionals so that we have more healthcare professionals available including nurses nursing assistants and other ancillary services lab radiology and respiratory therapy all right let's go back to these non-compete agreements there is new pennsylvania legislation what is it and what's it expected to do? Sure. So House Bill 1633 um, is the is the current legislation. And uh, what it's aiming to do is to help our employed physicians avoid non-compete uh, uh, contracts. And so um, there was a recent FTC ruling um, that would ban non-competes in for-profit systems. But that does not include the not-for-profit systems, which most of our hospitals are under non-for-profit for profit status. And so the House bill would prevent non-compete clauses in the employed environment, whether it was for profit or non for profit. Yeah. So and where is it in the legislature? Right now it passed the House. It passed um, the so House, it's moving right. to the Senate. Um, you know, we, we also are looking at our small independent practices and saying, how, how can we help them as well? Because one of the issues in the past, which is why non-competes were put in, was because a, a small practice would hire a hire a physician train that physician, and then that physician would leave, open their own practice down the street, and <laughs> take their patients. Um, take and, their patients, yeah. And, and so it was, it, was, it was in position for a good reason. So it's like at, a retail business. Correct. Um, but, you know, as, as we've seen a lot of our physicians join big healthcare systems, th that's not necessarily the case anymore. Um, and, and so we're, we're trying to, to, to protect our physicians and say, how can we protect our physicians as well as their patients to ensure that patient-doctor relationship stays in the forefront? Now, on the national level, the Federal Trade Commission has also a new rule on the same subject, correct? Correct, what yes. Is that rule? Yeah, and so that rule is, is specifically for for profit. Um, and, and that ruling was a three to two ruling recently. However, there is uh, right now a suit that was, was brought by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce against that ruling um, because it does affect not only physicians, but, but um, you know, employees of, of various different um, environments. Yeah. So when we talk about these non-compete clauses, what does it mean to all of us who are patients? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing is, you know, we want to we want to keep physicians in our community, and we want to keep that patient doctor relationship sacred. And so, you know, if you like your doctor, you've been through a healthcare crisis with them. Say, you know, you had a, a type of cancer, or you have a rheumatology issue like lupus, or 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 rheumatoid arthritis, and you've been with that doctor for 20 years, and now that doctor feels that they're the best thing for them is to leave they that also practice environment. They also retire, right? Correct, <laughs> yeah. And and so if they're leaving that practice environment and moving to a new practice, we want to make sure that patient-doctor relationship is still available to the patient. That's a great point. And it's also important as we seek out physicians, specialists, 
you know, where do we go? How do we pick one? What do we know about them? That's all. It all gets very complicated. I think that's one of the things with medicine right now. I think patients are looking for continuity of care. Uh, you know, they want to see uh, a doctor that they like and they trust, and they want to keep that relationship. And when you're, you know, when when you're being transitioned from from one place to another, you want to make sure that that information is available, that that information uh, yeah, about your care is, is is right, uh, you know, in, in front of the the physician that's caring for you. Yeah. All right. What what other issues the, is the Pennsylvania Medical Society dealing with that the folks should care about that that would affect them? Sure. I, you know, one of the one of the bigger issues for us is scope of practice um, and ensuring that the, the physician stays the leader of the healthcare team. Um, you know, we, we have been seeing more and more, um, you know, different different uh, healthcare providers like nurse practitioners and physician assistants, um, you know, uh, lobbying for independence and 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 um, independent care and and one of the things that we want to ensure is that you know we as physicians have you know 12 to 16,000 hours of training in our specialties yeah. and and we want to ensure that patients are being cared for um, with the physician of that leader of that team and I, I'd work with great you know, advanced practitioners, sure. and, 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 you know, a lot of them are very knowledgeable and, and, and very good at what they do, but we want to ensure that there are safeguards in place so that patients are cared for in a, a good quality and, and safety. Yeah, that's a great point. And are there particular specialties that there are shortages in that uh, folks should be aware of? Yeah, so specifically primary care is always a, a challenge uh, for, for patients um, seeking primary care. Primary care is the, is the foundation of healthcare. Sure, absolutely. And, you know, and, and, and the primary care is, is really kind of the quarterback of the healthcare team. Um, and, and we have a lot of specialists and, and consultants that, you know, that are available and people obviously that work in the hospital like myself as an emergency physician. Yeah. But, but primary care is, is, is really, um, you know, the, the people that, that do a lot of the work for patients and, and they're the ones that, um, you know, we're lacking in certain communities, especially in our rural yeah. communities. I'll tell you, uh, before I let you go, uh, there, you must see all kinds of people who are seriously injured because of accidents, automobile, truck accidents, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, that's correct. And as we're getting into the summer months, motorcycles, you may see, you know, out in the road more often. And, and um, you know, there are, you know, obviously laws as far as, you, you know, um, that— um, you know, have have more flexibility as far as helmets and, and other things. You know, we don't have a helmet law in Pennsylvania, and you're allowed to ride without one. Um, but, you know, we would encourage people to be safe when they're on their motorcycles and, and wear helmets and wear the safety gear. There are a lot of accidents with uh, bicycles and uh, oh, exactly. things with more than fewer than four <laughs> wheels <laughs> yeah of course you know bicycles you know we always we always recommend wearing a helmet you know um, you can't replace a brain and you can't replace a head yeah, that, so that. and so uh, you know it's it's very important to, to you know abide by the laws um, that are out there and and you know ensure that yeah. you know you're you're staying safe on the roads yeah that's a uh, extremely important and uh, driving is not uh, the best <laughs> that's for sure <laughs> All right. Well, look, I want to uh, thank you for coming on the program. This has been an, a very, very important update. All right. We will see you next week for another edition. No, we won't. We're on break. See you in a couple of weeks. <laughs>